the Good Old Grateful Dead cast, the official podcast of the Grateful Dead. I'm Rich Mahan with Jesse Jarno, exploring the music and legacy of the Grateful Dead for the committed and the curious. Welcome back to the Good Old Grateful Dead cast, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you're having as much fun with these episodes as we are. Thanks for being here. If you haven't already, please subscribe, give us a like, and leave a rating. It helps spread the show to those who haven't turned on to it yet, and we so appreciate your help. Thank you. We are cruising at high speeds through this track-by-track celebration of the 50th anniversary of Working Man's Dead. And if you haven't already, be sure to treat yourself to the expertly remastered re-release of the album, which was done so skillfully, it now reveals parts of the mix you may not have noticed previously. As always, there's bonus content, this time in the form of a show from February 21st, 1971, at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York. It was mixed by Jeffrey Norman from the original 16-track analog reel-to-reel tapes at Bob Weir's TRI Studios in Marin County, California. And there's also a 12-inch picture disc available featuring the Working Man's Dead album art that you know you need in your collection. Cruise over to dead.net to check it out. While you're there, visit the Deadcast page, dead.net slash deadcast, where you'll find additional information and media related to each episode so you can do an even deeper dive. You can listen to past episodes, and while you're there, record your story for the Deadcast. Click on the Learn More button, enter your info, click Start Recording, and we'll check it out to see if we can use your story in a future episode. Well, one of the greatest things for me about being involved in this podcast is getting to have some of my questions about the band answered that have been stewing in the back of my mind for who knows how long. In this episode, we uncover some absolutely fascinating information about the creation of one of the Grateful Dead's most poignant and enduring masterpieces, Black Peter. And we put to bed a couple topics that have been the point of conjecture for some time now. I love how this one came together, and we hope you do too. Jesse? After side two of Working Man's Dead opens with the exuberant Bakersfield bluegrass mashup of Cumberland Blues, the album goes dark. Way dark. Here's co-producer Bob Matthews. Black Peter was one of my favorites. Black Peter I loved. I still love to this day. Just the emotion and the emotion that Jerry was able to convey in his rendition of that. I mean, still one that is a tearjerker. I know that Bob Hunter always liked how that came out. Tales from the Golden Road co-host Gary Lambert. Oh, man, it's you know maybe the single darkest thing in the repertoire. Incredibly mournful. Again, that Hunter obliqueness that he's not explicit about what's happening there. You know, he leaves elements of it to your imagination. The thing about the fever rolling up, but going to roll back down, there's a certain hope expressed, but it is extraordinary and so powerful. And it was one of those things about the Grateful Dead that I really respected was that they never hesitated when songs like that were in the concert repertoire. The Grateful Dead never hesitated to kill your buzz <laughs> in, in what, I, what I think is a very positive way. There might be people who were there for just the happy, danceable, psychedelic thing. And the Grateful Dead would be playing something just stunningly melodic and wonderfully rhythmic and have you dancing. And then they would take this hard left turn and basically say, okay, now it's time for you to gaze into the abyss. Have you met the abyss? Here's the abyss, you know, and, and, and make you confront your own mortality. You know, it, it might be a song like Black Peter. It might be some incredibly dissonant feedback or, you know, just very dark instrumental statement that they made. And I loved that. That was part of what I cherished about the experience, that they presented your life in all its complexity and, and, and made you deal with things and made you confront things. And Black Peter was one of those late-in-the-show moments that could really make that happen. Black Peter was a heavy song with an enduring power in the Grateful Dead's repertoire, becoming one of Jerry Garcia's most consistently played originals in the quarter century after it was introduced. With its languid tempo and faded lyrics, it can be somber and revealing, for both singer and listener, filled with wisdom about the passing of time and the briefness of life, 
sounded far more mature than the 28 years then upon Robert Hunter's head. Its lyrics resonate with the works of poets and philosophers stretching back centuries. There's no question that Robert Hunter was what people call an old soul. Though it might not sound it, by a certain metric, Black Peter also might be the single most psychedelic song written by Jerry Garcia and Robert Hunter. It began with an estimated $50,000 worth of LSD. New Potato Caboose, recorded June 8, 1969, at the Fillmore West in San Francisco, released on a bonus disc that came with the 2005 Fillmore West box set, the last recorded version of New Potato Caboose as it happens. It was a Sunday evening in San Francisco, the end of a regular old four night stand at the Fillmore West. The most people in the dead kept referring to the place by the name it had when they held the lease with other local bands, the Carousel Ballroom. This week in June, the Dead were headlining early and late shows over Motown saxophonist vocalist Junior Walker and the L.A. band The Glass Family. Each act played an early set, then the late crowd arrived. The Fillmore West staff often let audience members from the first show stick around for the second, and this Sunday was probably no exception, though it gave the bands a few hours to kill between sets. It had been an eventful few days already. On Friday, Jerry Garcia was tardy for the late show, and Bill Graham made the band go on without him, with Ohm's Wayne Sabalos playing in Garcia's spot for part of the set until the Dead's regular lead guitarist returned. On Saturday, Janis Joplin stopped by for a screamadelic Turn On Your Love Light. Earlier that show, the band debuted Jerry Garcia and Robert Hunter's Dire Wolf, written less than two weeks earlier, which we covered a few episodes back. On Sunday, June 8th, the early show proceeded well enough, as we heard from that excerpt of New Potato Caboose. But then all hell broke loose. Roy Janice was ready to kill us. It wasn't our fault, but she was ready to kill us. That, of course, was Jerry Garcia. That and the next part of the story come from Jerry on Jerry, a five-hour audiobook of Dennis McNally's interviews with Jerry Garcia, available from Hachette wherever you get your audiobooks. Thanks, Dennis and Hachette. This portion of the conversation describes the night of June 8, 1969, and features Jerry Garcia and Mountain Girl, along with Dennis McNally. Backstage, the apple juice had been electrified. I mean, I just, I wet my lips on that, and that's all, because I heard it in dust. Yeah, me too. Fuck. I took one tiny little and sip. I got really stoked. Yeah, I, I remember I took, I took a sip that was probably a teaspoon and a half. Well, uh, that's, I'll just try that. I'll just let that bit do, you know. 20 minutes later, there was people just coming Laughing. apart all around coming me. Coming apart is the truth. Yeah, it, it, what the a disaster. <laughs> Poor Phil. Phil had to be led on stage. Well, By Mickey. Oh, I don't even know if we played that night. Yeah, we played. Yeah, we played. We were out of it. I mean, it was, that was bad. At least on the tape of the night, it sounds like Elvin Bishop replaces Garcia for the first part of the set. But who's to say what actually went down in the ninth dimension that evening? Here's how Phil Lesh experienced the night, from his 2005 memoir, Searching for the Sound. It was as if the music was being sung by gigantic dragons on the time scale of plate tectonics. Each note seemed to take days to develop. Every overtone sang its own song. Each drumbeat generated a new heaven and a new earth. That moment may well have been the peak of psychedelic music for me. The combination of absolute inevitability and ecstatic freedom has never been equaled. On the tape, Elvin Bishop can be heard joining the band. Lesh continues, The myriad voices of the music were fused into an oblique, schizoid, undulating, seven-dimensional parallelogram. When I finally dredged up the nerve to look at Elvin, he had the most clearly delineated deer-in-the-headlights expression that I've ever seen spread all over his face. Owsley Stanley was mixing sound for the dead that night, recording a sonic journal as usual. Roni Stanley was with him. This story and many others are featured in her memoir, Owsley and Me, My LSD Family, co-written with Saturday Night Live writer Tom Davis. Here's Roni Stanley. And there was a very notorious drug dealer named Goldfinger. 
And the reason he was called Goldfinger was because he had lost his hand in a helicopter accident, smuggling, and Bear had gotten him a jeweled, like, Captain Hook hand. That was beautiful. He wore it, and that was his nickname, Goldfinger. He was always full of drugs. And that night that we're talking about, what happened was Goldfinger spiked the punch backstage and Owsley spiked the punch backstage. And neither of them knew that the other had done it. It was a bad scene. And Owsley was really, really pissed at Goldfinger. Because, you know, he shouldn't have done that. You know, Alzi was in charge of that. And then Goldfinger came in, didn't tell anybody, didn't ask. So he broke a sort of outlaw law. Jen Joplin had some of her band members there. She had formed this new band. And some of them had never had LSD. And they took the punch. And it was double dose. So they didn't have a good trip. They ended up in the hospital and she was really angry at Bear and and they were really close because both of them were from the South and they were both born on January 19th. And they really, even though one was into alcohol and the other was into psychedelics, they loved each other. And this caused a huge rift. And Janice was never quiet, and she was really pissed at Bear and yelling at him. But it really wasn't his fault. It was Goldfinger. We were always the last to leave any venue. And so nobody else was there. We left the carousel and Bear was going to go to Goldfinger's to confront Goldfinger. Why did you do this? Look at how many people in our scene have been adversely affected. We get out on the street, on Market Street, and I found Hunter and I heard this voice looking around what's his voice you know market street is in rough downtown san francisco where the carousel ballroom was is not where you want to hang out and there's hunter and he was sort of crouched between the gutter and the sidewalk and he's mumbling and he's like owsley stein and he sees us and he's mumbling he's not coherent i remember talking to bear and saying we can't leave him here Bear is like uni-focused, ready to go to Goldfingers. I'm like, no, we cannot leave Hunter here. Bear went and got the car, and we managed to get him into the car. And we took him over to Goldfingers because that's where Bear was going because Bear wanted to confront Goldfinger and to tell him, you know, that was a bad thing to do. You have to be responsible with LSD. Terry the Tramp, I'm sure, was there because... Bear called him. Terry was Bear's right-hand person. Terry was the hell's angel who distributed the LSD for Bear. And he also had given us the owl, a little screech owl. Bear would call Terry. And also, given he was a hell's angel, he could have some control over Goldfinger, who was a, a bit of a loose cannon. I'm sure that was why Terry was there. I think that we figured out that he had taken over a thousand micrograms considering what Goldfinger had put in. I mean, when Goldfinger finally got back that he and Bear worked on exactly how many micrograms. (laughs) If you drank a cup of the punch, how much would you have gotten? How much was the dosage at that point? Hunter never did anything moderately. He probably took a full cup because he was gone. He was really high, and it, it's not a high that makes you happy, and it wasn't a high that made him feel like he was one with the divine. I couldn't talk him down, and Nikki, Nikki Scully was there because she had was having a relationship with golfing at the time. She couldn't talk him down. Nobody could talk him down. Bear, you know, we had all these B vitamins. Bear thought that taking multi-B was a way to get you to come down off acid. He wasn't coming down and he was ranting. I don't know why. I don't remember being gone that high. So I was more cautious about how much LSD I was going to take. And I never felt like taking it at a show like that 
was such a good idea because a lot of times people did dose you and you didn't know it. And I, I was very ethical about that thing. And I thought that was the wrong thing to do. And I, I even had problems. I had arguments a lot with Bear about dosing, you know, whether you should really dose. And, and also people would make chocolate chip cookies and dose them. And I always thought that was a mistake because of the children, that we had children around. So I had a, you know, more of a moderate view. It's one of the things that happens on LSD, and, and it's actually one of the beauties of LSD is that you are not your ego, and you're not Robert Hunter, who's the lyricist for The Grateful Dead. That's just sort of an object. Who you are isn't the object, isn't the body, isn't the action you do. It's different. It's more of the divine. And in order to get to the universal consciousness, the divine, you have to shed all those things. They have to die. And it's very painful. And I do think that he went through that dying of the ego, of all the aspects of himself that he was attached to that night. And it was painful. And so Hunter was very high all night long, all into the morning. And Bear decided, I think it was Bear who decided to call Jerry Garcia and have Jerry come over. Jerry didn't come again already until like almost morning. But when Jerry came, that was a big help. Until Hunter could come to his senses, he was put under the mindful watch of the hell's angel known as Terry the Tramp. We'll let Robert Hunter's housemates, Jerry Garcia and Mountain Girl, pick up the story from here. Hunter was lying on uh, Market Street, and he said lobsters from the ninth dimension were devouring downtown San Francisco. (laughs) There was Owsley space, and he just had to take a swing at it. In fact, when I saw him, the first thing that came out of his mouth was Owsley Stein. (laughs) (laughs) Owsley Stein, he's there mumbling and muttering shit. He was so out of it. I remember you went to get him. Yeah, I went to ice. The call came about nine in the morning. I came up, and there was Terry the Tramp, you know, sitting with him as nice as could be, you know, just looking after him, and I just want to make sure he doesn't hurt himself, and... You know, How did we get home? We drove home. I we, drove us We home. drove home about five miles, five miles, <laughs> five miles right. an hour. Weaving <laughs> through the hallucinations. Across <laughs> the Golden Gate Bridge, it was foggy. Oh, God. Like oh, yeah. And awful. then I had to drive back to San Francisco to get, yeah. to get Hunter. You know, And I was barely able to deal with it myself. But, yeah, but Hunter was gone. I mean, right. He was like 19 sheets to the wind. You know, he, he was, was really, out there. He was, he the had, poor fucker, he was really stoned. And he was just coming into the bringing in the sheaves part of his acid trip, you know what I mean? After, after you know, <laughs> like, oh, well, you know, the golden light of, uh, right. of Buddhism glowing off in the distance somewhere and all that shit. I mean, it was, he was done in. Robert Hunter was a few weeks short of his 28th birthday. He had a horrific night. Or more to the point, during that night, he lived and died several horrific lifetimes. He saw blood pouring from Janis Joplin's mouth. In Dennis McNally's words, Hunter experienced every assassination he knew of, dying with JFK and with Lincoln, among many other trips. Holy wow, talk about heaviness. In the 90s, in a public correspondence with psychonaut Terence McKenna, part of their Orfeo dialogues available at levity.com, Robert Hunter wrote that he witnessed, quote, the end of consciousness, and that the incident, quote, effectively marked paid to my acid career. Someone who has crawled naked across the Sahara doesn't spend much time in tanning parlors. And that's the story of how Robert Hunter came to write the lyrics to Black Peter, an author who'd recently died a thousand deaths. It bonded Hunter and me. We became really good friends after that. I started hanging out at their house, and I guess it was in Larkspur, where M.G. and Jerry and Hunter lived together. It was gentle and nice. It wasn't wild or crazy at all. It was very loving. I think Annabelle was born there. Mountain Girl already had sunshine, and she was there. And it was in a beautiful area, and their backyard was like went right down into a ravine, and there was a swing down there, and you could play in the grass or the knoll. It was more like a knoll with a big wooded area. And Janice lived down the street. It was actually quite a great time. It was, And it was our first venture out of the city of the Grateful Dead family. 
Jerry was always, it was a round kitchen table and a window over there and Jerry would sit there and he always was playing his guitar, not plugged in. He'd play the electric guitar, not plugged in all the time. And Hunter had just, he just had one room up there in the bedroom and he, he would scribble away. And I remember a lot of things that Hunter was into at that time was getting over your fears and not letting a fear of something control you. And that if you had a fear, the best thing to do was to meet that fear head on and to see that it would dissipate. You know, like his song, Lay Your Cards on the Table, how can you play your hand if you don't lay the cards on the table? That sort of after that LSD experience became very important to him. If you have a fear, meet that fear and then it will dissipate. If you're afraid of dying, meet your death. Hunter was 28 when he wrote that song. And people commented, how at 28 could you have such profound sense of life and death? Everybody at that time was very into astrology. The Grateful Dead and that whole family, we were into that kind of thing. We were into the I Ching. We were into astrology. We were into Chinese astrology. It was universal. And 28 is the time when you have your first Saturn returns. And what that means is that is the time when the path that you're supposed to go on comes clear to you at age 28. And it, you go on a path that you follow for probably another 28 years. That was a big bridge of your first Saturn returns when you, your karma comes to you and you choose the path. Several characters named Black Peter predate the song's writing, and a few of them seem like they could have been in Robert Hunter's cultural scope. David Dodd's super useful, annotated Grateful Dead lyrics, book and website, have a list. Black Peters appear in both Dutch and Russian holiday traditions as the unpleasant companions to the more jolly St. Nick. In 1964, director Milos Forman debuted with Cherne Peter, Black Peter, a pioneering film of the Czech New Wave. And before that, a character named Black Peter appeared in The Once and Future King, T.H. White's 1958 reimagining of the King Arthur legend. There, the character Black Peter appears in the form of a sullen magical fish, the King of the Moat. A fan of fantasy novels, Robert Hunter may have been familiar with the character known as Mr. P. Black Peter had, quote, a face which had been ravaged by cruelty, sorrow, age, pride, selfishness, loneliness, and thoughts too strong for individual brains. There he hung, or hoved, his vast ironic mouth permanently drawn downward and of kind of melancholy, his lean, clean-shaven chops giving him an American expression, like that of Uncle Sam. He was remorseless, disillusioned, logical, predatory, fierce, pitiless. But his great jewel of an eye was that of a stricken deer, large, fearful, sensitive, and full of griefs. Somebody commented that Black Peter had the same cadence and rhythm as this opera by Buchner called Wojciech. I remember talking to Hunter about that opera because it was a fabulous story and I knew it and Hunter knew it. And the person, Buchner, who, who wrote it died young and it's a tragic, tragic opera. So how did Robert Hunter imagine that Black Peter might sound? The clock strikes three, Papa jumps to his feet. Already Mama's cooking Papa something to eat. At half past Papa, he's ready to go. He jumps in his bureau, headed down the bayou. He's got fishing lines strung across the Louisiana rivers. Gotta catch a big fish for us to eat. He's setting traps in the swamps, catching anything he can. Gotta make a living, he's a Louisiana man. That was Rusty and Doug Kershaw's Louisiana Man from 1961. In a box of rain, Robert Hunter's book of collected lyrics, he wrote that this was the original model for how he imagined Black Peter might sound. It was, quote, a jumpy little tune the way I wrote it, he said another time. In a box of rain, he continued, Garcia took it seriously, though, 
dressing it in subtle changes in a mournful tempo. Just then the wind came squalling through the dome. But who can the weather come Just wanna have a little piece to die. The bridge, Robert Hunter noted, was, quote, written after the restructuring of the piece and reflects the additional depth of possibility provided for the song by Garcia's treatment. See here how everything lead up to this day. It's just like any other day that's ever been. Sun going up and then the sun it goes. For Sean O'Donnell, musicologist and chair of the music department at the City College of New York, the middle section of Black Peter transcends what a listener might expect from the song's bridge. You know, you think you just have a kind of blues dirge going on at the, the beginning, and it seems fairly straightforward, but then there's this harmonic interlude. It takes you pretty far afield. There's a sort of like a dream passage where you're just in this other harmonic realm. And then when you get to sort of the climax, then you're suddenly far afield, and you have this F chord that is the part that everyone responds to, but you can barely remember that you were in this blues dirge before, you know, where someone else would have made a, a song out of just the blues dirge part. Maybe one related contrasting section, not a whole sort of dream sequence. It took just under six months for Robert Hunter's horrific acid experience in June 1969 to make it to the stage. In early December, The Dead debuted Black Peter, the same night as Uncle John's band, at the Fillmore West, the same venue where Hunter had taken too much acid a half year earlier. It was the same week as Altamont. And on December 7th, the night after the disastrous Free Festival, Black Peter was the song the dead opened with. Here's what some of that first draft of Black Peter sounded like, recorded a week later, on December 12, 1969, at Thelma on the Sunset Strip in L.A., released on Dave's Picks 10. Run and see With Uncle John's band, Black Peter was one of the first original songs the band adapted to their acoustic sets in late 1969. This is how it sounded on February 13, 1970 at the Fillmore East, released in 1973 on Bear's Choice. The dynamics are just a little different. This is just days before the band began the Working Man's Dead demos. Now, let's go run and see Run Now let's move over to Pacific High Recording in San Francisco in early 1970 and check out the Angel Share session outtakes. They're very similar to what made it to Working Man's Dead. The basic instrumental takes feature Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir on acoustic guitars, Phil Lesh on electric bass, and Bill Kreutzmann on drums. The first hard part was aligning everybody's instruments in the headphones. Here's Kreutzmann and Garcia. Can you hear the drums, Jerry? No. Oh, well, that's no good. The second hard part was getting through a take in one piece. Oh, man. Wrong chords. Fuck. Let's take it again. 
There's a really great complete alternate take of Black Peter that you can hear on The Angel Share, available through streaming services now. I adore Garcia's vocal performance on this one. The people I know But the people don't care That a man could be as poor as me Take a look at poor Peter He's lying in pain Now let's go run and see But that's not to say there was no studio magic involved in the making of Black Peter. Here's Gary Lambert. It's also interesting to hear the studio chatter and the outtakes because even though they did prepare a lot and even though those songs were well on their feet before they went into the studio, you also hear the fine-tuning and the introduction of new ideas before they go to a full take. And so the creative process didn't completely stop when they got into the studio by any means. They were refining and discovering exactly how to play those things. I also want to add that the way just little instrumental details come out on this album, Black Peter, you know, Bobby's rhythm part is just these exquisite little fills. You hear a little bit of Pigpen's organ on there, which was not that present in the music by that point, but comes in at just the right point, and a a bit of Pigpen's harmonica as well. The small details that they attended to on the album are really telling, and it rewards repeated listenings. I, I still hear things on some of these older records if I go and revisit them years later. I'll say, oh, I never quite noticed that little bit of detail there. Pigpen's harmonica appears for the first time on Working Man's Dead just before the final verse of Black Peter, like a character we'll hear more from soon. The people I know But the people don't care That a man could be as poor Though Pigpen didn't appear on many songs during the band's acoustic sets in the spring of 1970, he'd often add the organ part he played on the studio version of Black Peter. Black Peter is a beautiful piece of art that came out of a harrowing experience. But it was one of only two important effects of the night Robert Hunter got massively dosed at the Fillmore West. Here's Jerry Garcia on the last part of the morning from the Hachette audiobook, Jerry on Jerry. And I sat there, and uh, that was just after uh, that Crosby, Stills, and Nash record first came out. And uh, Nikki was playing that on her own hi fi and I sat there. I got it even printed, but listening to that record about nine, 19 times, so I was waiting for Hunter to get to where he could walk around. Crosby, Stills, and Nash's self-titled debut came out just after Memorial Day, at the end of May 1969. It was one of the year's biggest albums, and would have been virtually impossible for Jerry Garcia not to have come into contact with the trio's harmonies sooner or later, that he did so while coming down from a massive acid trip with his closest collaborator is only a small nuance. CSN's influence can be heard all over Working Man's Dead and American Beauty after that, just as it could be heard on countless folk rock albums that are still being made. Unlike most of those, though, Jerry Garcia soon became friends with Crosby, Stills, and Nash and influenced them right back. To tell that story, we're honored to welcome to the good old Grateful Dead cast, Graham Nash. 69, we were in uh, uh, Wally Hyder's studio in San Francisco. We were doing Deja Vu record. We had uh, just con- constructed a very simple track of Teacher Children, my song. <laughs> when I first played that song for Stephen, he said, that's a really beautiful song. Don't ever play it like that again. I said, <laughs> what? He goes, no, this is the way this should go. And he put that great Stephen Stills right hand picking pattern, you know. It was great. So we had the basic track. 
And so obviously, um, because it was Stephen, we said, well, okay, so what are we going to do as a, as a solo? And he goes, well, you know, I seem to be playing guitar all over this, uh, this record. I don't know. What do you think? So Crosby came up with the idea of, of talking to Jerry. Now, the Grateful Dead were in the next studio to us when we were doing Deja Vu, and the Jefferson Airplane, of course, were, you know, in, in another studio at the same time. So I, I'd never met Jerry, so I asked David to, to, because he was David's friend, why don't you go and talk to him, because I, I'd, I'd never met him, you know. So he came back, he said, actually, yeah, he, he, he's got his, uh, his pedal steel with him, and um, he'll give it a shot. And I said, give it a shot? He said, yeah, well, because he's only just been playing it for you know, a couple of months, and, you know, but he'll give it a shot, you know. So Jerry came in and he set up his pedal steel and we greeted each other, of course. I mean, of course, I knew exactly who he was, you know, and I wasn't that stupid. And he set up his steel guitar and we, and we played the track for him and he, he listened to it. He goes, okay, yeah, I'm Tim, sure, all right, start, press the red button. So we start recording and we get to the end of the song and I go, fuck, that was amazing. That was <laughs> I mean, you got it. That was fantastic. The spirit of what you played, you know, that was fabulous. He goes, yeah, well, you know, I screwed up a couple of places, you know, right before the chorus there. Can I do another track? And I said, of course you can do another track. I'm probably not going to use it, but you can definitely do another track. So he sat down and he played another track. And uh, I said, yeah, well, you know, you did. You did repair that one small hole there right before the chorus, so I can take that from this new track. But the first time you played it has the spirit of the song in it. That, that's what it is. That's the spirit of Teach Children. I thought that when we made the track of Teach, that it could possibly be a, a radio hit, you know, because I wrote a, a lot of songs with my friends in the Hollies. I think we had, I don't know, 15 top 10 hits before I left. And I was only with them for seven years. So I knew it was going to be a radio hit. When Jerry put his steel guitar on there, there was no doubt in my mind that it was going to be a big hit because of what he played. And I don't think anyone can listen to that first 20 seconds of that intro and not just fall in love with it. So that, that's what happened. Graham had never heard the story of how Jerry Garcia became imprinted by Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but he did have something to say about the legend that Crosby, Stills, and Nash taught the Grateful Dead how to harmonize. It did happen. We weren't teaching them. We were just showing them how we did it, you know, and they went, wait a second, one microphone opened up all the way around and then just you three standing, that's how you do this? Yeah, watch this. Wait, hey, Bill Halverson, our engineer, play, play a track of whatever, right? And, and we would stand there and sing and they went, wow, oh, okay, simple. We can do that. So we didn't teach them to be able to harmonize because you can't do that. You either can do it or not. But uh, we certainly did uh, encourage them to sing. It was the beginning of a cross-band partnership that would result in both Crosby and Stills joining the dead numerous times on stage in the next years. The very first performance of Teacher Children took place at a dead show when Stills and Nash dropped by for a surprise duo set at Winterland in San Francisco on October 25th, 1969, playing between the dead and the Jefferson Airplane. The first public performance ever. And it was only me and Stephen because... Um, the Dead were given a concert at, the, I think, the Fillmore East, and uh, Stephen was invited, and he invited me, and he invited David too, but, but uh, unfortunately, Christine, uh, David's girlfriend, had just been killed a week or so before, and, and David was in uh, no state to even be in public. You know, he was mourning uh, very deeply. Um, and so it was just me and Stephen, and... Uh, we didn't have any plan of a set, you know. Stephen just started playing songs, and I would join in if I could and stuff. And uh, and then Stephen goes, "Oh, we have a country song for you." There's a little country tune we know. On the road, 
must have a code that you can live by. You can read the whole story of that set in a recent feature on Jambase, written by our buddy Steve Silberman, and hear audio of the set remastered by engineer extraordinaire Charlie Miller. By then, Graham Nash migrated north to San Francisco and settled in the Haight-Ashbury, a year and change after the dead left. We'd just done that first record. We'd spent a lot of time in L.A. Obviously, Stephen had a house there, and so did David. He had a a house in in Crater Lane. I didn't have a house. I'd been living with Joni for uh, almost a couple of years. And then our our love affair ended, and uh, I needed to get away. And because David had all these friends up in in Northern California, I decided that I would go there. And I I tried San Francisco and I love the city. It's it's an incredibly beautiful city. I found this uh, four-story house on on Buena Vista East Park, East, you know, there by by the hospital, right next door to a white house, a huge double white house. And on the third floor of this gigantic house next to mine on Buena Vista Park East was this ginormous speaker. And when I mean ginormous, I mean the thing must have been eight feet round and, you know, maybe 15 feet long. The mansion had been home to Buena Vista Studio, where the Grateful Dead recorded their first single, Don't Ease Me In, Backed by Stealin', released by the local Scorpio Records in 1966. Graham Nash and members of the Dead would collaborate even more during sessions at Wally Heider's in San Francisco that unfolded during 1970. I was uh, making songs for beginners also at the same time, in my spare time. <laughs> um, and, and Jerry played a uh, steel guitar on uh, I Used to Be a King, and uh, maybe one other thing. I didn't pay him for the session. I didn't know what we were supposed to do, you know. So I, I gave him a, a Fender Strat that I'd bought in, uh, I think, Phoenix many, many years earlier when I was with the Hollies and we came to probably 67. And I bought this vintage strap and I, I gave it to Jerry. And he immediately put on an alligator sticker and that became the alligator guitar, which just recently sold for over $400,000. Jerry Garcia started playing the 57 Strat in mid-summer 1971. The serious modification started the next year, including the alligator sticker that gave the guitar its name. Alligator would become Jerry Garcia's first seriously modded guitar. Alembic technicians outfitted the Fender with new tuning pegs, a few different bridges, a new control plate, and an onboard blaster for extra volume boost. It played an important part in developing the so-called Bakersfield Dead sound of the early 70s, as we heard about during our episode on Cumberland Blues. As Garcia told David Gans in 1981, what I really wanted was to be able to get some of that metallic clang strats have, that crispness you associate with country and western guitar players. It was part of a wide-scale transformation in the way Jerry Garcia conceived of his own music and his songwriting with Robert Hunter, starting in 1969. Songs like Black Peter were the result. Here's Garcia talking to journalist Ben Fong Torres in 1976. This is from a CD called Got Some Things to Talk About. The first two records that we wrote together were totally unwieldy. I mean, the songs are just, they're just, only a couple of them are, are remotely singable. Most of them were t- just too awkward. They're too wordy. Yeah, and that was before we started to learn about the little niceties of songwriting, that you should leave room for people to breathe and stuff like that. <laughs> the eight songs of Working Man's Dead wouldn't suffer for lack of singability. Even Crosby, Stills, and Nash tried singing one eventually. Much more recently, in fact, around 2012. One day, Rick Rubin got in touch and wanted to do an album of acoustic songs that we wish we'd written. Uh, it was really a brilliant idea, songs that we wish we'd written. So, of course, if we were going to take a song like James Taylor's Close Your Eyes, you know, close your eyes, right? We had to make it sound like we had written it. And so there's a, seven songs that we did with Rick Rubin. None of them worked out particularly well for us, we were going through a lot of changes at the same time, and so was Rick. We didn't feel that he was uh, uh, genuinely interested in what we wanted. For instance, we wanted to do Norwegian Wood and a Blackbird, and he told Crosby, oh, no, no, there'll only be one Beatles song on this record. And Crosby said, there'll only be one Beatles song on this record if we say there's only one Beatles song. From that moment, it was over. 
but it, it was quite an interesting project for sure. I listened to a, a few of them uh, uh, last week, as a matter of fact, and uh, they sound pretty good, but, but we are our severest critics, you know. It, it gets past the three of us, and it's probably, you know, right to be able to be played for you. Though Songs We Wish We'd Written is still on the shelf, you can find a few murky live clips of CSN singing Uncle John's Band on YouTube. Uncle John's Band and Black Peter would become the Grateful Dead's own most sung songs from Working Man's Dead, with Black Peter slightly in the lead. Except for a brief pause around the time of the Dead's 1975-1976 touring hiatus, Black Peter was a song that Jerry Garcia sang year in and year out, from 1969 all the way up to 1995. It's a song that aged with the band. Here's Buzz Poole, author of the 33 and a third book about Working Man's Dead. Black Peter, it is an ode to death. It is really powerful in that sense. But I think over time, it became much more powerful for listeners because the dead were getting older. Pigpen, certainly Keith and then Brent and then Garcia's health problems starting in the 80s. You know, I think they these songs take on even more poignancy because you're you know, at times you're up there basically watching a specter of death sing a song about death. And, you know, that's not the case in 6970. You know, Gar- Garcia was in, he was having a high time. He was in great shape. He was happy. He was, everything seemed good. So I think Black Peter is one song that certainly would have a evolving kind of way, the, the impact it would have on the audience. I fit better into Black Peter now than I did when I was 16, which, because the song obviously hasn't changed, but I have, and, and uh, that's the power of, of any art. We evolve alongside it. I probably belong in that camp, too. By the time the song returned in 1977, it found its own kind of soulful quiet, with Garcia occupying and navigating the vocal in new ways as his voice aged. Here's how it sounded at Red Rocks in Colorado on July 7th, 1978. On Working Man's Dead, Garcia had doubled his own vocals on the bridge with a touch of falsetto. Phil Lesh, I think. Shine through my window And my friends, they come around Come around Come around Donna Jean Godshow joined the bridge vocals when the song came back in 1977, and the whole section became a gang sing-along during Brent Midland's tenure. Here's what it sounded like on July 12, 1989, at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C., released on CD in 2017. But the song's biggest fireworks display was generally a final round of Garcia singing Run and See before springing into the solo. Here's how it sounded at that same RFK show, 20 years and one month after Robert Hunter's fateful night at the Fillmore West. Run and see. I love the point made in this episode that the Grateful Dead songs mean different things to you at different points in your life. Certainly Black Peter 
has evolved to mean more to me as I age. And the song is just haunting, familiar, comforting, and disturbing all at the same time, if that's even possible. Thanks again for tuning in, friends. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and rate the podcast so we can get it into the ears of more people that need to know what this music is about. Take care. Executive producers for the good old Grateful Dead cast, Mark Pincus and Doran Tyson. Produced for Rhino Entertainment by Rich Mahan Productions and Jesse Jarno. Special thanks to David Lemieux. All rights reserved.